Are you looking for a new job? Are you hiring but can't find diverse, talented candidates? Then we have something that can help, our job board. Head on over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to browse listings or to place your own. This week on the job board, Design B&B is looking for a senior designer in Chicago, Illinois. Fidelity Investments is looking for a principal designer for their UX design and concepting team. This is a remote position, but they're also open to candidates in Boston, Massachusetts. UC Davis is looking for an assistant professor in interaction slash graphic design for their Department of Design in Davis, California. The University of Texas at Austin is looking for a tenured senior colleague, associate or full professor in design for their Department of Design in Austin, Texas. Friendly Design Co. is looking for a UX UI designer. They're looking for candidates in Washington, D.C. or Omaha, Nebraska, but are also open to remote applicants. Aptio Inc. is looking for a product designer, too. This is a remote position. And Work & Co. is looking for a lead developer as well as a senior QA analyst. Both positions are located in Brooklyn, New York, with hybrid work schedules. For just $99, we will feature your listing on our job board for 30 days and help spread the word about it to our audience of listeners. We also offer an annual job board subscription for companies and organizations. Make sure to head over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs for more information on these listings and others. Apply today and tell them you heard about the job through Revision Path. Get started with us and expand your job search today. Revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Revision Path. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving, got to spend some time either with friends or family or just by yourself and hopefully not having to work. Um, I'm your host, Maurice Cherry. And before we get into this week's interview, I'm letting you know once again about this year's holiday gift guide we created. You can check that out on our website, revisionpath.com. Now we're releasing this episode on Cyber Monday, so it's not too late to check out the gift guide and get some great stuff. Hopefully shipping hasn't gotten too bad yet. Now let's take some time out and thank our accessibility sponsor for this episode, Brevity & Wit. Brevity & Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They accomplish this through graphic design, presentations, and workshops around IDEA, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. If you're curious to learn how to combine a passion for IDEA with design, check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity & Wit creative excellence without the grind. Now for this week's interview, I'm talking with Matsoshi Matsafu, an illustrator and creative who is currently working as a senior UX designer at Microsoft in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. So my name is Matsoshi Kolofelo Matsafu. I am originally from South Africa and I've been based in the US for almost five years years, six months, and a couple of days. I am currently working as a senior UX designer for Flipgrid, which is a subsidiary of Microsoft. And essentially, it is like a video exchange software where it became really popular during this pandemic because it was really useful in the education field. And yeah, I work in tech and I create digital artwork from time to time and I illustrate and I into music into a lot of things uh, that just like equal creativity I guess that would be the sum of me yeah okay I was gonna ask you about Flipgrid because I had not heard of it before Mm -hmm. so I'm guessing this is a company that Microsoft like acquired and you work on the team yes yes so it was acquired actually not too long ago and essentially we make a a really robust video editing camera and software that's available online, predominantly for students and educators now, but it, you know it's expanding. And what I love about it is that I get to work directly with real educators and 
we'll get into this a little bit later, but I spent some time doing ESL teaching myself. And there was always a need for tools to uh, kind of help students that aren't necessarily comfortable speaking out loud in front of a classroom forever or giving them prompts and creative ways to elicit a response. And this is one of the things that I get to build on a day to day. And that's what really is exciting. Yeah, I could see how something like that would be really useful, especially with so many classrooms sort of over the past, God, two years now, geez, like adapting because of the pandemic and, and, uh, and things like that, but also not just schools. Uh, we've done some work in the past with the Smithsonian and mm -hmm. I know that they do or they tend to have curriculum for schools, like summer programs and things like that. And I could see where they could even use something like that because like, especially in terms of curriculum, a lot of schools will look to museums and such for, you know, field trips and things like that. But when you can't travel to the museum for a field trip, then how are you supposed to get that same sort of, I guess, cultural exchange? So I could see how Flipgrid might be super useful for something like that. It certainly is. And I'm really glad that you went into that because looking at some of the very surprising use cases that have come about. It's exactly that. It's families connecting with each other when being divided because of COVID, um, sending each other video messages on a private, secure platform. It's teachers obviously connecting with their students. It's uh, book clubs and choirs and auditions for uh, plays that are happening on this platform because it's a way to be able to kind of ruminate about what you want to create, but not have so much pressure to have it be completely perfect too, and still be able to express your creativity. So I think that's kind of why I love it. <laughs> okay. So how has 2021 overall been for you? Oh, I can say there's a definite shift in terms of my feeling of not being tossed into the wild <laughs> like 2020 was. Yeah. Um, I think the acclimation that has happened, whether it be from a mental health perspective or from an understanding how I work and what works and what doesn't, like a lot of people, the introspection helped a lot. And it has definitely been a year of revelation for me as to what's important, you know, yeah. well, how do I want to spend my time? What do I think is worthy of my attention and what relationships do I need to foster and how do I hold myself not so much accountable, but how do I grow in a non-pressurized and from a perspective of love standpoint? You're located in Minneapolis, which last year was such a a nexus point for so many things happening just in this country around mm -hmm. police brutality and mm -hmm. protests and things of that nature. How was mm -hmm. it being like in the city during that time? It was incredibly wild because a little bit of history. I grew up on in the dredges, like the, the, the end or not quite end of apartheid in South Africa. And so when I saw the tanks patrolling the streets, it, it just drew me right back to memories of growing up in a policed state wow. where white people were trying to kill us <laughs> and they were holding AK-47s and there were tanks patrolling the areas that we were essentially forced to live in. We call them townships. And if you speak to a lot of South Africans, kind of like if you speak to a lot of indigenous and black people here, there's been a kind of a reclamation of areas that we were sent to die, essentially, by calling them townships or the hood and not actually calling them what they are, which was essentially a concentration camp. <laughs> wow. Um, we are resilient people. And all I remember is seeing those riots and understanding what is driving people is not about actually the incident that occurred. That was just the tipping point. This iceberg has been building. And like everywhere in, else in the world, I, I was really in turmoil about the conversations that were being had and the ones that were being avoided. There was so much focus on the masses of people, black and brown bodies showing up and demanding to be heard. But there was very little talk about what would lead to folks to be so desperate and so disenfranchised and so broken to have to break up our own resources. That just doesn't, doesn't it doesn't just come from nowhere, mm -hmm. you know, and thinking about, you know, looking at we need to talk about colonization 
We need to talk about settlement. We need to talk about the remnants of capitalism. We need to talk about all of these things that show up in these ways. <laughs> and it's incredible to me that a lot of those things were not being talked about. So it was hard for me because I had a little bit of PTSD, not a little, a lot. I was afraid to go outside some days mm. because I couldn't reconcile seeing tanks and young kids younger than me in uniforms holding rifles ready to do what? <laughs> you know? Wow. I can only imagine how much of an eerie parallel that had to be to see that as an adult and then to remember how that was in a totally different country as a child. Like, oh my God. Right. The only thing that's different in the world is that some regions, things got given names. Ours was called the bad date. In Europe, they called it the Holocaust. Here, it's loosely called slavery. <laughs> mm. But the remnants of all of that are ever present. And that was the most sobering thought. But on the flip side of that, though, because I, I always try not to <laughs> dwindle in the maelstrom, is that whenever there's destruction, creativity booms. And so walking through a ghost town where things are boarded up, but people have reclaimed those boards and created some of the most incredible public art that I've seen in all the places that I've lived. And that was a wild experience, you know, people expressing pain through art, like visceral, tangible arts. <laughs> and the dichotomy of emotion that comes as you're walking through a street knowing that at any point a crowd could come rushing through, breaking windows, but then immediately after folks will be boarding up and painting. Those are such extremes. <laughs> yeah. Goodness. I, <laughs> geez, it almost feels weird to try to pivot back to talking about what you do for work <laughs> after, after focusing on, on that. But I mean, I think what you bring up and certainly from your unique vantage point of, you know, like you said, having lived through a very similar type of situation as a child, like, one thing that really struck me during the pandemic last year was how many people I talked with, you know, for this show mm -hmm. and us, even in these conversations like you and I are having, trying to reconcile what it is to be black and work during this sort of time and like mm -hmm. have to compartmentalize the issues that are happening in our society and what's going on outside of our windows while also expecting to like show up to work and be productive and still, you know, hit your numbers or whatever you have to do for work. Like, mm -hmm. oh, goodness. Yeah. Wow. It was wild. And in as much as it feels like it's a, it was a total alien experience, I think every single person who was really, just really in tune, it felt like you're having an out of body experience because you're looking at the world going up in turmoil, but at the same time, you're facing yourself, like truly having the time alone with yourself <laughs> to really figure some things out. And one of those things is reclaiming your time, even from work, which I think I saw a lot of evidence of, you know, being black and creatives really standing up for, you know what, you're not entitled to have 18 hours of my day. You're entitled to have this many hours of my day and I'm entitled to have this many hours and I'm going to pour love into myself, however that looks like. That was certainly something that, that came up a lot. And I was appreciative of seeing that too because you just don't know how many of us are functioning on empty. We never take time off. We always have to work harder than everybody else. We have to explain things and be the cultural competency <laughs> solution mm -hmm. <laughs> in most of our jobs and having to do all of that labor without getting paid for it, even though most of us do have a so-called equity, diversity and inclusion department in our uh, workforces or workplaces, they don't infiltrate the every day. The day to day when you get on a call immediately after the Floyd incident and somebody makes a joke about murder as a icebreaker. Yeah. Like how navigating those and having to like have a conversation with your manager and having to not teach all of these white people, <laughs> but that's not the right thing to do. Yeah. So I guess I'll, I'll try in some way to pivot this back to work, but not in a complete way, but 
Mm-hmm. What do you do to separate yourself from work when that sort of stuff happens? Well, Black Twitter has been very helpful. <laughs> 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 and the reason is that without black creatives, all of the social media platforms would have been dry. The amount of effort that people have put into creating humor out of nothing or making really think pieces just in a quip, you know, like one tweet that makes you really reevaluate things or laugh so much that you can forget for a little bit of time has been helpful. And also because of building new language and and ways to talk about things that are quite heavy, but there's a lightheartedness to it, right? And the memes that keep coming up (laughs) across the board, that has been one way to help. And of course, other things include being very intentional about mental health practices, simple Mm -hmm. things, taking breaks, going for walks, engaging with people that I love, my friends, my family, And also pouring time into things that make me happy. And they may not necessarily be hobbies per se, but just things that make me happy. And that's it, really. I try to keep it as simple as possible because sometimes also trying too hard is trying too hard, you know? No, that's (laughs) that's very true. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Around that time last year, I was was actually unemployed. I had gotten laid off from my job right before... Memorial Day. And Mm -hmm. I was feeling this sort of a different kind of tension because at that time, like I'd say the summer, at least June through August was really the first time in my professional career that I had any sort of a break Mm. and that I didn't have to feel I needed to like rush out and get a job or something like that. Like I've, you know, like you have down periods between jobs and stuff like that. And I would always feel like, oh, I got to go find something else. But Mm -hmm. I was fortunate that I got enough of a severance and had enough savings that when I got laid off, I was like, oh, I'm good for about like four or five months. So Mm -hmm. I'm just not going to do anything. And it was so, for me, it was so odd to like reconcile this time of rest Mm -hmm. with this huge time of unrest happening Uh, you know, out in the world and, and, you know, in a way almost feeling guilty for yes. taking a break and not like getting out in the streets and, and what have you. And I think sort of what I, I, I don't want to say I rationalized it, but I don't know. Have you seen the Toni Morrison documentary, uh, The Pieces I Am? I think that's what it's called. Mm-hmm. She has a part in the documentary where she talks about her role or what she felt her role was in the civil rights movement. And she was saying that, you know, mm-hmm. Like, I can't go out and be on the streets. I can't do that, go out Mm -hmm. and march and things. She's like, but what I can do is, Mm -hmm. like, publish your writing to get to Mm -hmm. a bigger audience. Like, I can support the writers and the poets. And, like, I can help fight in a different way. And so, I guess even in a small way through this podcast, I felt like, oh, well, as long as I'm sharing this out still with people, then I won't feel so guilty or guilty at all about, like... I don't want to say taking up arms because it sounds like I'm joining a militia, but like I wouldn't feel like, oh, I, I'm i not out there, you know, marching the streets with a sign or anything. It was such a weird, weird time because really like, I mean, I've been a working professional for so long, but I've never really had that time where I could just have a break for like several months and not worry about what the next thing was that was coming. Yeah, that whole existence was some of the most trying because for myself personally, I had the added layer of being an immigrant in this country. And so I was having such a push and pull in my mind. It was like, oh, when my country was going through its liberation, similar things happened. People on the streets, other countries came and stood up and people were in the crowds and bodies were out there. But what it means for a black body to be out there (laughs) is a whole different thing here. And when I was talking to different types of different groups of folks who those who were adamant about physically being present and also on sometimes that came with judgment too, right? That if you're not in the streets, then you're not really participating and you're not really standing for anything. And I think that needs to be to Tony Marson's point that needs to be taken to question because we all have our different roles to play. Right. And so I think 
we need to really talk about expanding what resistance looks like from a more holistic view from, yes, we have bodies in the forefront. Yes, we have intellectuals that kind of theorize. Yes, we have business people that are like, okay, how do we change these structures? Yes, we have uh, money people even like, okay, so capitalism is not working. How do we think about it different? How do we build an equitable society? Not just in the moment, but what happens after that? Yeah. And that's where I think design comes in. And that's why I'm excited to be a designer because in, even in the smallest things that I'm building, those things play a part. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go more into your background. I know you, you mentioned earlier being from South Africa. Tell me about what it was like growing up there. I mean, you mentioned uh, apartheid, but mm-hmm. what do you really remember from your childhood aside from that? I mean, it's a, oh my gosh, it's like a, <laughs> it's a kind of a, a Willy Wonka experience, right? There's moments <laughs> of extreme, like insurmountable joy and awe because of the creativity of black people, music and art expressed. I think the first time I encountered design was in the township. Like we, most people grew up in what are called like shanty houses, which are made out of tin, aluminum kind of boards or even asbestos at some point. And it's one room, there's no electricity, toilets outside, everything. But the creativity to make one room feel like a home, that is invention. And I remember there were there was a neighbor that I used to um, visit who took the covering of a, of a can, you know, just like a can of, there was a, a brand called Lucky Star Mm-hmm. And it, it's sardines, essentially. But the graphic art on the label was so striking because we were kind of in that era of just like um, poster designs so like really bright colors and just beautiful typography. And they spent however long gathering those labels and made wallpaper out of them. And when you look at that and I look at that and I look at what is called so-called modern design and I, I can see that that could easily be be in a pop art museum because that's the kind of art that that it was. Or it could be likened to mid-century modern repetition wallpaper too. So I feel like design came through just because of necessity. Design is the answer to to anguish and pain. (laughs) Design and art and creativity is the answer. So it was everywhere. And Mm. I was lucky enough to notice. (laughs) And now being around it as much as you have, when did you sort of decide that this was what you wanted to study? Like, this is what you wanted to go to school for? I initially wanted to be a fine artist. And I remember in high school, one of my memories is my mom made the decision to send me to what we then called multiracial schools, which meant I was a handful of black kids in a white school, which was interesting. But I really loved my high school because it was in the middle of a forest and I was in boarding school. Mm. And it was designed like a little European village, I suppose. And the classrooms had a lot of natural light, which is very, is not common here. All of the classrooms look like prison industrial complexes. And one thing I remember is painting. I would paint for hours. I would, I would be covered in paint from 7 a.m. in the morning until 6 p.m. when I had to go back to the hostel. And eventually when I was head of hostel, I had the keys to the hostel And because I don't know why I was lucky enough to be in a really nurturing environment and my teachers believed in me and I would be painting well into the night and they trusted me. And that's odd. That's like it's unheard of as a black girl in a white school (laughs) painting (laughs) these massive three by six pieces and being free to do so. That's one of my best memories. And, And from then I thought, okay, I'm going to pursue a career in fine art, but reality hit when I left school and things were not good. (laughs) And I got accepted into one of the biggest, best art institutions in South Africa, but I couldn't afford to go. So I found a design school down the road from me and I literally took all of my paintings, my huge portfolio, 
in public transport <laughs> <laughs> and walked up a hill or two and arrived at the administrator's office with my ill-fitting clothes and a hat over my head and sweating and being like, I do art and I think I can do design too if you give me a chance. <laughs> And now this school, that was uh, Vega School, is that correct? Yes, yes. And I spoke directly to the head of department at the time. Uh, his name is Gordon Cook. And he's an eccentric white man, not typical, very much future thinking. And he saw me, I'm sure when he saw me, he was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what, what? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? <laughs> and I was disheveled and I had this big portfolio case of art pieces and he looked at my stuff and he was like okay we're gonna give you an entrance exam and I wrote the paper and the last question <laughs> I answered and I thought oh my gosh I'm ne they're never gonna accept me I, I don't know what I'm trying and then they accepted me and so I landed up doing design and multimedia at the time which was the introduction to digital which is interesting like user interface design and also um, animation and, of course, communications and just graphic design. So that's how I started, and I haven't looked back since. Wow. Yeah. So once you, you graduated from there, like, what was your early career like in Johannesburg? Did you feel like the school had really prepared you to go out there in the working world? In a sense, yes, because when I was working, there was definitely a push to have more Black creatives. And so I found myself in a network of just like really great black creatives. We all grew up in similar ways, um, but some, of course, more extreme than others. And it was just a really great, because you've got to remember that my country has multiple, I'm going to use the word tribes loosely, but multiple cultures too. And because of the separations, some of them were just like melded all together. And so if you can imagine being in a brainstorming session with people from like multiple cultures, but we're all in the same country, all speaking different languages and just throwing all of ourselves into it. The, the texture of what came out of those years is amazing. Sometimes I look at that work and I'm like, wow, South Africa is just an incredible place in terms of creativity because it's such a, a vibrant with different cultures. So yeah, that's kind of what stood out. My first job I was making those really, really terrible user interfaces for phone recharge cards. I don't know if you all ever had that service here where you prepay for like $30 worth of money to put on your phone so you can call people. Mm, I remember those. Oh, my God. This was back in, I'm showing my age here. This was like back in the early, like late 90s, early mm -hmm. 2000s. I remember those because I got my first cell phone in... 1999. God, I'm, <laughs> I'm really dating myself here. I got my first cell phone in 1999. And I remember having to like buy cards to put mm -hmm. minutes on it. Like it was exactly. from a, it was yes. from, yeah, like it was from a provider. It was from Powertel, yes. which is now T-Mobile, but I had yes. to like buy cards and put like 500 minutes on it or something like that. Yes. So those little machines that you would buy your minutes from yeah. and the buttons were all embossed and made in Photoshop and terrible. <laughs> like reading pills. Yep. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, somebody had to do that. Somebody had to do that work. <laughs> it was, oh, it was terrible. And then, I mean, there was cell phone, the cell phone companies were coming up. And so we, I'd be making little animated banners on the sites that would just live there. And then I worked for a production, like digital print production, which it wasn't creative work, but I think it just taught me the basics and how to work quickly, print stuff and B2B stuff. And then I worked in a uh, network, BBDO, a subsidiary of like the larger network agency, the global agency. And that was really, really fun. I was paired with a copywriter and we were one of the few fully black creative teams, like all women creative teams. And we got to work on some really fun campaigns, local ones, but also some international brands. And yeah, and then... I remember the turning point when I decided to leave advertising. I loved the advertising world. I'd learned a lot. I was in charge of people who had been in the industry for so many years. And I was like, I'm making ads and you're older than me, but you have to know <laughs> what I have to say. Oh my God. 
<laughs> this is so scary. <laughs> and it was just so fun, very exhilarating. And then I decided to leave home because of a number of things, but also primarily because I felt like the the advertising industry back home, whew, this is hard, was kind of masquerading as being for black people, as in using black imagery and our colloquialism, like our style, our dress, our lingo, our music, and selling us these things. But in real life, it it wasn't really reflected for most people. Mm-hmm. And one of the so-called marketing research sessions we did was with a group of, of aunties. I would call them aunties like they're, you know, most of them single mothers and caring for multiple people in the household because, you know, our culture is as such as that you're not an island. And so they'd be caring for multiple kids. And so why it disturbed me is that the company I was working for wanted us to encourage this demographic to use what would have been their 12th check in December, which they would usually use to stock up on supplies for the following year because people aren't rich, you know, Mm -hmm. you buy extra bags of flour and you send them out to the village or to the, you know, neighboring family you share. And that's the way we're all able to survive. And so we were trying to encourage these aunties to spend that money on a cell phone contract. Mm. And I was like, no, I'm not doing this. (laughs) I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned that about advertising, like the part of, so I live in Atlanta and Mm -hmm. the part of Atlanta I live in is, I want to say it's the black part of town, but like most of Atlanta is the black part of town. But the neighborhood that I'm in, the West End is kind of one of the more, I'll say one of the lower income areas of the city. It's a historic neighborhood, like Morehouse College is here, Mm -hmm. Spelman College, like it's well known in terms of just like black history and, and whatnot, but I do see a lot of the advertising that's done around here and it's always for like prepaid cell phones and, Mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Like for things that don't really better the community in any sort of way, it's just like, Hey, you just got paid. Give us your money, you know, like, and not even for like well meaning holistic things. It's like, give us your money so you can buy some shoes. Give us some money so you can buy a combo meal or something like that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it felt sickening at some point to know that we're putting things out there that actually catch people's souls because that's what we're meant, what we're trained to do as communicators, as media makers, as creatives, is find a nugget that makes people feel that connectivity to being human and (laughs) exploit, use, expound upon whichever one you want to use and sell them a product. Yeah. And that felt really disgusting to me. So I left. And I also just kind of wanted to experience life. I had originally wanted to go to Korea to go in. And uh, no, I originally wanted to go to Japan to apprentice with a, a calligraphy master and eventually become the second black samurai. That's what I wanted to do. Okay. <laughs> because Yasuke is one of my heroes. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, okay, well, I'm 24. I don't really have any reason to not to just stay in one place. I really love Japan and Japanese culture. I consume manga and mawa and everything. So I wanted to go there. But I applied in Korea as well. And Korea got back quicker. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I didn't, I didn't have the resources to just travel. I knew that I'd have to work. And teaching English felt like an easy way because I'm really good with languages too. And I didn't mind kids. So I was like, all right, so if I teach English, I can save up money, I can travel, I can build some character, learn about different things, and maybe I'll still figure out how to be a samurai. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, Machoshi the samurai, that has a nice ring to it. Right. That's what I thought. I, I had <laughs> everything. I was going to have my braids. It was going to be so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you decide to leave Johannesburg, leave South Africa, go to South Korea. Like, I'm sure it was a big culture shock, but like, what ways did I guess? Oh, so many questions. One, how was it a, a culture shock for you? And two, like when you think back to that time, what really sticks out to you the most? 
the funny thing is that I think moving here was more of a culture shock for me than moving to Korea. Hmm. Okay. Yes. The reason being is culturally, I think indigenous cultures, we tend to have similar social structures ah. in the sense that you never address your elders by their first name. You defer, and there's a, a different type of way of speaking, which is a more formal or informal. And that was familiar to me. There were things like gestures to show reverence for older people. Like you don't just hand somebody something without supporting your arm. And it was universal. And all of these things were apparent even before I learned the language. And so those things felt familiar. And also our families tend to stay together. Your grandparents raise you or have a part in raising you. You grow up not just as a nuclear family. And the idea of all for one and one for all, we share resources. There's even a word in Korean called chong, which is the direct and same meaning as a word in one of my language called Ubuntu. And Ubuntu and chong loosely translated mean the spirit of humanity that we are beholden to as humans and should respect and impart upon each other. And that's powerful to me. Interesting that moving from South Africa to Korea was not that big a shock, but moving, yeah, I could see how moving to the U.S. would be a big, it's definitely a huge change for that, especially depending on the part of the country that you're in. Because even what you're describing in terms of that, like, familial structure, like I'm from the like deep South from Alabama. And mm-hmm. in a way it's sort of similar to that. Like the mm-hmm. town I grew up in Selma is a very insular town. And so even as you're like describing that sort of like family structure and like reverence of elders and things like that, that's still like very much a thing. Right. Now it might be different in other parts of the country. Actually, I know it's different in other parts of the country, but like, mm-hmm. yeah, even mm-hmm. depending on where you would move here and, settle in like it is totally totally different Mm -hmm. i mean there were the obvious things right there were reactions to my skin color obviously and we'll we'll get into the not so nice things about that there were reactions to my hair there were reactions to my perfume because when i moved there black people i don't know anybody who doesn't use cocoa butter or shea butter like that's just what it is yeah And there at the time, it was difficult to find things that we were accustomed to, like lotion that doesn't have whitening agent in it mm. or deodorant. We, I had to import some stuff because it was just not commonly used. And so there were so many reactions, reactions to my hair, obviously. I, I remember one day standing at a bus stop and I felt something tugging at the back of my braids. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And I turn around and there's these two really small grannies and their, their faces are all wrinkled like crinkle paper. And they, they're playing with my hair. <laughs> 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 and then I have this moment of don't touch my hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at the same time, I'm looking at the expressions and I had learned a little bit of Korean then and I understood what they were saying. And they were saying, A, that my hair was beautiful and that it looked so familiar to a style that their ancient Koreans used to do as well, because they also used to braid hair, Mm. right? And braids were something that royalty used to have. And so they were talking about that and I decided to focus on that aspect of the conversation. And even though it was a teaching moment, like next time, please ask, it was also a humbling moment for me to have grannies that are like 70, 80 years old being fascinated with my hair and not from a judgmental perspective. That's the beauty I drew from those moments. But when there was full out racism, oh man, who I had direct jobs declined because I'm black. I People were not shy to say oh, wow. uh, very clearly, uh, we need you to speak in an American accent in order to have this job. And we had to send photos in with our resume. And the moment they got my photos, they would just say, no, sorry, you're, you're not what the school wants to represent itself by. In other words, you're not blonde on white hair, white haired and blue eyed. <laughs> yeah, there were some serious racial offenses. 
But as you know, those are all over the world if you're walking around in a black body. This is true. But I would imagine, you know, even more so in such a homogenous country like South Korea or like in Japan or something like that, it's it's definitely Mm -hmm. a lot worse because what it does, it's not I mean, it's one thing for it to be racism, but similar to how it is. Well, maybe not so similar to how it is in the United States. It just impedes how far you can go in society. Like it sort of keeps Mm -hmm. you, the racism keeps you down literally at a level where it's preventing employment and any sort of like social rise in that way. Right. But at the same time, it was a, it was a balance of, yes, I'm being racially profiled and these things are happening and I'm not able to make a living in some and there were some spots where it was really bad. And I was like, oh, my gosh, if I don't get another contract, I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but then at the same time, because teaching wasn't the only thing I was doing there, I was performing music and I was doing like graphic design and design stuff, freelance and production assistant on some films and things like that, because I never stopped being a creative in those areas, because of what I looked like, I had so many opportunities. Like, I was a wedding singer. <laughs> oh, wow. Because <laughs> everybody had this idea of a black soul woman in a red dress just, like, belting out <laughs> these, mm-hmm. <laughs> these love songs from the 50s and jazz. And I was like, all right, I'll play that role, sure. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it was there was aspects of living in Korea that was so fun. Like I got to perform on stages, I got to do weddings, I got to be in a couple of movies and ads, I got to sing in K-pop songs. <laughs> it, was like, <laughs> it was a trip and purely because of being black and because of the consumption of black culture, you know. So mm-hmm. I have to sit with myself and reconcile, you know, some of the really negative feelings around that. But for the most part, I was just like, okay, at least in in the grandest scheme of my life, I can say I once did this. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. I can. I mean, those are the kind of memories you keep with you for a lifetime. Just mm-hmm. great stories too to tell to get to know people and things like that. Yeah. So in in 2016, you ended up relocating here to the United States mm-hmm. in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. How was it making that change? It was brutal. <laughs> mm. It was brutal. I wasn't even based in Minneapolis first. I was based in Duluth. Cost. Okay. <laughs> and Duluth is like, yeah. it's a college town, but it's also an old town. So not a lot of people are on my age. And it was in the middle of winter. And I'd never experienced a winter here. Oh, wow. You went to like one of the <laughs> coldest parts of the country oh, in the no, winter. My goodness. It was, it was, it was brutal, but it was, I think, a character building exercise for sure. I don't think I've ever felt more homesick than in those years. And especially considering the, the political climate to mm-hmm. being in a small town in a almost reddish state and being highly aware of how many or how few black people there were in the vicinity was very jarring for me. Did it ever get that cold in Korea? Oh, yeah. I mean, it did get cold. I think the Minnesota cold hits different, though, because because of all the other things, right? Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, I I hear. I feel you. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Oh, so, and also you came, because if if you came in like the winter of, 2016. I mean, that was just such a a contentious time in this country because we had the change in leadership from Obama to the president whose name I shall not mention, but like I, I can only I can only just all of that combined. Did you feel like at the time that you had made the wrong choice? Absolutely. I had so many moments of oh, I was like, why would I choose this? Why why <laughs> but I also knew that I also know that life has peaks and valleys. And if anybody grew up the way that we grew up with all the things that we've seen, this is nothing Yeah, you know, in the grandest scheme of things. 
there's there's growth to be had here. And that's why I think I'm still in the city is that I feel like the city is a, is a place for trading water and refining, refining. This is a place where I refined, okay, I want to work in tech, but what do I actually want to do in terms of my career? Is my career serving my purpose, my innate purpose, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, or is it something that I do for money? Do I feel like the surroundings or the circumstance determine my happiness? Those have been very, uh, oh, I've had to be very, very, very active and intentional about answering those questions for myself because it would have been a really a much harder time. Yeah. If not. Yeah. How has the Minneapolis like creative community been for you? I mean, it sounds like wherever you've managed to go or wherever you've managed to be, you've tapped into some creative community, whether it's in Johannesburg, you know, in Korea, you mentioned being a wedding singer and all this stuff. Have you found like similar creative opportunities or communities like that in Minneapolis? When I'm being intentional about it, yes. And this is, except for the past two years. (laughs) Right, right. Because of the pandemic. Yeah. Right. The thing that I appreciate about here is that even though it was very difficult to find black, brown communities, there are things that show up like events. And if you're active, you can figure it out. I mean, I had at some point been planning my month's activities in advance to go to book launches or independent films or a live sketch, <laughs> anything that would put me in proximity to creativity and art, like visiting galleries or talks or going to a photographer's, uh, you know, exhibition, something, anything. And when you do that, then it is very possible to find a, a bunch of creative people right now. I mean, attending a lot of virtual things and slowly getting into communities. There's there's pockets of really interesting things that are happening in the city because, oddly enough, there's tons of funding for the arts, like tons of funding for the arts. And so when you really go out there, you realize that it may not necessarily be completely futurist yet, but there's an underbelly of, of building here that's really exciting. Black people owning co-ops, black people owning artist collectives and, and exhibition spaces, black people putting on shows and, and you know, music and theater and everything. And you're just like, wow, this is this is actually really great. I never mm-hmm. expected it here. I would always be going to Chicago and New York around LA to find those. But more and more, I think people are actually staying in Minneapolis and deciding to build it here rather than seek it elsewhere. We just had uh, on the show a few weeks back someone that's in Minnesota, Teresa Moses. She's mm. a she's an educator at the University of Minnesota. She mm. also has a, a design studio called well, Blackbird yes. Revolt. And I've had other folks on the show, I think, in the past that have been in and around Minnesota. And and of course, as I mentioned to you, I know some people there Mm -hmm. just personally. So I've always heard like great things about the community there. And I'm glad you were able to really sort of tap into that to hopefully Mm -hmm. make it feel, I don't want to say like home, but at least feel like it's a place where you can can be. Yeah, absolutely. I actually know Teresa. Uh (laughs) Oh, really? Okay. All right. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Tell us and hello. (laughs) Oh, uh, yeah. We'll get <laughs> you mentioned to me that you wanted to talk about how to embrace being a Black creative in flux. And I'm sure that a lot of folks in our audience want to know how to embrace that, especially during the midst of this very uncertain, weird time that we've been now in for about two years. Can you like expand on that? So when I think about that, it's essentially how in this time of what it means to be a black body working in corporate world, especially in a creative profession, our creativity is very closely linked to our identity. And now you're working with your identity and your identity is now your work. And so you have to really think about like, how do I separate, you know, how do I accept that my emotions, my state of being, my home life, all of these things, the fact that I'm in a black body is going to influence my work, whether I like it or not, you know? And the expectations that are put on us to be at the forefront of creating new 
isms and <laughs> memes and things <laughs> and, and media can, I think, lead to a little bit of an identity crisis. And I'm saying this out loud because I've certainly felt that way sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. and embracing the fact that, A, you don't have to be one thing. That's been the biggest thing for me is that, yes, the messaging around find your passion, l- gear your emotion and your focus and your work towards that passion and then it'll turn around for you and hopefully be equitable. Yes, but also we're multifaceted intersectional beings, right? And half of the time, all of the way that we're constructed around working and being productive and showing that we are worth anything is very Western, Being in one lane is a very, very just like constrictive way of being. Mm -hmm. And part of me kind of realigning myself with my cultural learnings and what feels true to myself has been this having grace for myself to say, okay, so I'm an illustrator, but I'm also a singer, but I'm also a writer, but I'm also a great orator, and I'm also a really great technologist, and I am also a great philosopher. Like, these are all the things that I am and more, and I can be good at all of them. I can be good at all of them. And I don't need to be good at all of them at the same rate at all, all the time, but I can certainly not squeeze myself into one lane feeling like that's it, and if I don't do that, then I'm not worth anything. Mm. So what is it that sort of keeps you motivated and inspired these days, like knowing that? Mm, you know, the the funny thing is I inadvertently surround myself, maybe not even physically, but I somehow manage to find people that when we connect, we kind of remind each other of our natural frequency of joy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And whether that be just a a conversation or exchanging a message or something, just to kind of reset and remind and inspire, right? That's what keeps me going. I have a friend of mine that, like a ton of my friends, we don't maybe not even speak to each other for six months at a time. But when we do speak, it was just like, oh, I remember what it feels like to be really happy existing in this time right now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And that's it, you know. And then on a more practical sense is not stopping the things, you know, bring you joy on a on a practical day to day level. Things like journaling, doodling without a purpose, not thinking of the final product, whatever it may be, taking pictures, cooking, doing something that removes you from being in front of the screen all day. Right. Don't stop doing those things and don't stop documenting because when you feel like there's absolutely nothing left, then you have a whole archive of things to remind yourself that you are more than your work and you are more than productivity and that you are an actual like massive being. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like that's a, a collective thing that a lot of people have started to really sort of discover within themselves this year you know we hear all this talk in the news about the great resignation Mm -hmm. and and people you know kind of casting away casting away the the jobs that they may have once had you know under sort of pre-pandemic life and doing you know their own thing like i know so many people over the past two years that have ditch their jobs just to become quote unquote content creators. And that's a very broad term, but like they're doing stuff on YouTube. They're doing stuff on TikTok. They're podcasting. They're doing any number of things that are not what they were doing beforehand because they realized as society sort of shut down and things sort of got stripped away, they sort of realized, you know, what's really important. Mm -hmm. And for many of them, it was not the jobs they were doing. So they Mm kind of had to tap into who they were and find out how they could become more of that authentic self and really lean into that. Right. And, and then also balancing the pressure of even if it's okay to be multiple things, it's also okay to be one thing. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we have this pendulum swing that keeps the happening where it's like stick in your lane or be a complete hustler and have five different, six different hustles going on at the same time. But some people aren't built that way. 
And the true thing is to really take the time to know yourself and understand how you're built and go with that. And it doesn't have to look like anybody else's thing. Absolutely. Do you feel like you're living your life's purpose now or do you think you're still searching for that? I think that's a constant search. I think if I ever assumed that I know or that I have found, then my ignorance is really set in deep, (laughs) personally. Mm. If I don't continue searching, refining, pivoting, learning, becoming new, then I personally feel that I'm denying the very nature of existence. Our cells change on a daily basis. You're not the same yesterday as you are today. Yeah. Our personalities, our minds are constantly evolving. And so for me, that means that everything should be constantly moving. Will I find some lanes that I'm comfortable in? Sure. (laughs) But to say that it's found, I don't think so. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I remember, I think this probably went around a couple of years ago about how the body's cells like replace themselves every like seven to 10 years. So Mm. in many ways, like you're not even, you're literally physically not the same person that you were because your body is always in a state of change. Exactly. Yeah. Right. To that end. And I, and I mentioned this because you had sort of touched on this a little bit before we started recording, but where do you see yourself in the next five years? Like, is it, is it staying in Minneapolis? Like, what do you want to do or where do you want to be in the next five years? I know for a fact that I'm building my life to be as such that I don't need to call one place home. I want to be three months in one country, three months in another country, in another city, in another, and be comfortable in all those places because I know that that's, that's what I need. To be a structured nomad, I suppose. Mm. <laughs> Because that's fun for me. I love learning. I love being immersed in different cultures. I love languages. And I love building and designing from that perspective of having multiple sources of of influx. Like that makes me excited. And so that's one of the things I'm building my life as such to make that easy for me, whether that means also delving into real estate and understanding how that works so that I can have another passive income that's actively happening. So I can facilitate my being able to move around, whether that's increasing my technical knowledge and skill. I mean, I can definitely work from home from anywhere in the world, but the more proficient I become in my particular field right now, or the things that I'm able to do, whether it be the illustration or the UX or design or getting even better at that so that it's easy for me to move around and I'm not encumbered by one contract. And I think I also definitely want to pursue some some business asp- aspirations that I've had that have kind of been lurking around. Yeah, so that's that's it. Like I want to be in a state where I can live anywhere in the world for three months at a time, unencumbered, uh, be working whichever way it is, whether it's through my own business or through contracts and to be exploring and learning about different cultures and also being able to spend a lot more time with my family because I don't like this, what's been happening for the past two years and not being able to hold my mom. Like I need to be able Mm. to give my mom a hug (laughs) and my brothers. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Woo. I just uh, got to see my mom this summer back in July. And I mean, it came unfortunately at a, at a tragic time because uh, my grandmother had passed away like Mm -hmm. suddenly. And like, that was the first time I got to hug her was after, was like after that happened, you know? And like, Oh, Oh my God. Yeah. (laughs) I know exactly what you mean. I know. Cause I, I live in Atlanta and like my folks live in Alabama and People will ask me like, oh, why don't you do what you do in New York or in San Francisco or da 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 or whatever. And I'm like, look, I got to be close to home. Mm -hmm. And even if it's just a state over, like that's close enough. Like I can't, I can't go too far out like that. I would love to, you know, maybe one day, but yeah. Ooh, sorry. That brought up something I was not, (laughs) I was not expecting to go there. Oh my God. No, no, no. It's real real, though. When you feel it in your, in your chest and in your throat and you realize that, such a simple thing. Oh, it, yeah. Man, there's not, right now, there's not even any words for it, you know? Yeah. But 
Yeah. I mean, I want to travel with my mom. Like that's, that's the next thing I'm going to, this is strange. I don't know why old people like cruise ships, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Look, oh my God, my, my <laughs> mom, my mom wants to go on like an Alaskan whaling cruise or something exactly. like that. Oh my goodness. I was like, you'll be, a, you'll be by yourself lady. I'm not doing that. But <laughs> <laughs> so sure i'm like what okay <laughs> that's what we're gonna do so, yeah yeah I, I want to to build a life where i can fully take care of myself and my mom and my family and just be like all right we're gonna be on a cruise ship for the next couple of months yeah and because that's what you want to do let's do it <laughs> yeah well just to wrap things up here where can our audience find out more about you and about your work and everything online so everything is under my first name, Machoshi, um, on the grams and Twitter, and that's M-A-T-S-H-O-S-H-I. And also my website is machoshi.com, and you can see all of my design work and uh, my forays into like creative experiments there. So yeah, that's where I am. Sometimes I'm vocal online, but most times I'm not because I live in the moment, and <laughs> that's just the way I function. Yeah. So if you catch an illustration or a thought here and there, cool. But I mean, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Well, Machoshi Matsafu, thank you so much for coming on the show. One, really for just sharing your perspective of working in the world and creativity in different countries and stuff, but just sharing your story, sharing the the deep thought that you have behind your work and around, you know, your artistic practices and everything. I mean, I'm kind of getting a little tongue tied. I, this was such a really good interview because we didn't really talk about your work that much, but I'm glad that you were able to really just talk about who you were and showing how, you know, being a black creative is not just the work that you do. Like it, it encompasses so many different things. And I really feel like, you know, you embody that. So Thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. And it was a wonderful experience. Thank you. Big, big thanks to Machoshi Matsafu. And of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Machoshi and her work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. And of course, thanks to our wonderful sponsor, Brevity and Wit. Brevity & Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They accomplish this through graphic design, presentations, and workshops around IDEA, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. If you're curious to learn how to combine a passion for IDEA with design, check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity & Wit, creative excellence without the grind. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Maurice Cherry, with engineering and editing by RJ Basilio. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. What did you think of the interview? Better yet, what do you think about the podcast overall? Please don't be a stranger. We'd love to hear from you. So hit us up on social media. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Just search for Revision Path, all one word. Or you can leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Let everyone know about the show because it really helps us grow and reach more people all around the world. As always, thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time. <laughs>